Welcome to Inflection Point Podcast, where we cultivate change from the inside out as we ponder the Cairo question. Will Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which he was born? We stand on the belief that dismantling racism goes beyond laws and legislation or politics and economics. Here, anti-racism activation is presented as an inside job where personal transformation and accountability impact social change. So take a seat at the Anti-Racism Activation Table with Inflection Point Podcast. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the newest episode of Inflection Point Podcast, where we are dedicated to the art of, the art of listening in authentic conversation. We challenge our audience to listen actively and intentionally for the purpose of self-awareness, understanding, personal transformation, and ultimately social impact. I am your host, Anita Russell, and here's a quick hello from co-hosts, Mavis and Gail. Hello, I'm Mavis Bauman. Hi, I'm Gail Hunter, and welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm really, really excited to be um, in the month of December, and we're winding down the uh, work that we've done this year. And so if you've been following us, you know that we have been doing this series called the Sankofa Generational Leadership Continuum. And we define that Sankofa Leadership Continuum as a through line running from historical leaders of the past to contemporary leaders of the present, to those who will emerge as future leaders. Melding together historical and contemporary reality, this through line inspires resistance, activism, art, literature, ethnography, and research that fuels transformation. So tonight we picked a particular individual that we want to uh, talk about their work and the, the gentleman's name is Robert P. Jones. He is the president and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute. So I'm just going to read a quick bio so you get a sense of who he is and why we decided that we wanted to highlight um, his work. He is the president of, as I mentioned, he is the president of the Public Religion Research Institute. He holds a PhD in, reli in religion from Emory University a minister of D divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and a bachelor of science in computing science and mathematics from Mississippi College. He serves as the national program committee for the American Academy of Religion. Jones writes a weekly newspaper, a, a newsletter rather, for those dedicated to the work of truth telling repair and healing from the legacy of white supremacy, specifically in American Christianity. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. He's also the author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, which won a 2021 American Book Award, Award, and finally, The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Grawemeyer Award in Religion. His book, The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy, emphasizes the importance of truth-telling and cross-cultural conversations in addressing the legacy of white supremacy and working towards a more equitable future. So this is an individual who writes quite a bit in, in the same spaces in which we've been having our conversations and thinking about um, the issue of white supremacy, how it ties to uh, racism, the work that we do in the anti-racism space. And one of the things that I wanted to mention is that one of the things that I really uh, appreciate about him is the fact that he traced his own roots and became kind of rooted in honesty about his own family's connection to the settlers colonialism project. 
And that is colonizers inviting and occupying territory to permanently replace the existing society with the society of colonizers. And so I read that as um, just giving him uh, some props, if you will, that he recognizes his own history from that, from that perspective and ties it into the work that he does today. So Gail and Mavis, you've had the opportunity to kind of dig a little bit uh, into Robert P. Jones and some of his work and, and all of that. So let's just start off the conversation. And some of the things, uh, one of the things in particular that he talks about is this need to challenge dominant narratives. So let's kind of dive into that conversation. It's not a new topic by any stretch of the imagination. We've been talking about um, tr telling, uh, sharing your own truth. Um, the, what, the, what do those dominant narratives look like as opposed to those lived experiences and all of that? So Mavis Gale, your thoughts or comments on this issue of challenging dominant narratives. Do I go first or do I Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I, I just um, want to tell something about uh, Mr. Jones that I think is so fascinating. I think, you know, part of, of, of all of his writing is challenging his own personal dominant narrative, right? And the story I love is about him looking at his family Bible that mm -hmm. went back to 1815, I believe. And he sees the names of his ancestors. And in one part, there are the names of their slaves and the purchase price of those slaves. So this man starts from there for his beginning. You know, who am I from that beginning? And uh, he, he delves right into it. And at the same time, he's talking about his own Christian upbringing, a Southern Baptist specifically, upbringing and education and how much information he lacked. And so I think this guy kind of leads the charge in challenging the dominant narrative. So that's what I wanted to add for now. <clears throat> excellent, excellent. And Gail, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's he was fascinating. I mean, I really am. Um was very, I'm very respectful of the work that he's done and how honest he's been willing to be and to look at his own past history as, as Mavis was saying. And, um, and he even looked beyond that, where did they get the land to even have the slaves and realizing that it was taken um, from, you know, it was taken, it was really not theirs originally. Um, so, I mean, he even dug deeper, which is, I think a credit to himself. Um, but most of all, he really, he has this ability to look at the, to dig up the truth and to look at it and to have others, people look at it with a level of compassion and understanding mm -hmm. and awareness of where and what white supremacy has really been about and why they are, so the people that are holding so tightly to that, wanting to bring back uh, great America, right? To, to go back to those time periods that he has a level of understanding and, and conscious awareness, which I'm, I'm impressed about. It can help people understand, okay, where is this within my own history? Mm -hmm. And what do I need to really look at? Mm -hmm. And I agree with uh, what both of you have said. And when you think about um, sort of the framework upon which Inflection Point uh, podcast rests in this, uh, this idea of having these courageous conversations, um, having the uh, wherewithal, if you will, to really, really look at where we are and how did we get here and understanding the importance of all of that in terms of education and bringing knowledge to the public. And so when I think about the approach that he's taken, starting with himself, look how well it aligns with the notion of critical self-reflection, right? Exactly. When people take those necessary steps, put them in that position of vulnerability as Brene Brown often talks about and make those courageous steps towards acknowledging what the truth is. And in this case, also acknowledging the role that my family played in some of these historical narratives. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I, I uh, commend him for taking that approach and really starting using that 
as a starting point and then also growing from there. And one of the other things that I really like about uh, his approach is that when he looks at the real history of America, it's obviously recognizing enslavement, right? The Africans enslavement. But I also like the fact that he really recognizes indigenous tribes and the nations that existed before colonization, right? And so when you think about that, and it, it kind of reminds me of uh, back in the day, if you will, when I was working on my master's degree, and one of the things, so I got my master's in um, uh, uh, educational leadership, right? And one of the approaches that I decided I wanted to take, very consciously made this decision, was that I didn't want to exclusively study uh, education through the lens of the African-American experience. I also wanted to study it through the lens of the indigenous experience. And so that's how I began to know and understand things like Indian boarding schools and the impact that that had on the nations and the tribes that existed here long before the colonizers arrived, right? And so that was one of the things in, in sort of looking through his materials and, and some of the things that he talks about that I admired is the fact that he kind of looked at it through both of those things that are interconnected because the colonization is very directly connected to the African enslavement. So you can't really separate those two out when you really take a genuine look at American history. Your thoughts? Right. Yeah, I, can't. I like go how they, oh, go ahead, Gail. <laughs> we need no, to I switch mean, off. You have to look at both in order to look at the history, but we, because we have to look at the truth and how many, I, and you'll talk about the, um, Doctor of Discovery later, but um, it's just, I never knew about that. How mm -hmm. many people actually really realized what was happening when even Columbus came over and what he had to go through to justify by the Pope and get the permission by the Pope. And at that point, it was all Catholicism. There was no other separation of church um, and divisions of, of it within the Catholic Church at that point that sanctioned his ability to go and build up forts, build up whatever, and destroy kill, genocide, I mean, we're talking about genocide, uh, Native American people that had lived here for how many thousands, thousands of years. Um, and it was at the same time that the, uh, the African slave trade was going on. And of course that then became the free labor, but it's just, it just is amazing to me that, that not knowing that, and then wanting now to ban knowing that in certain books, mm -hmm. about, people wanting to ban those books. I mean, it's like we have a major decision that each one of us has to make. Are we going to live by truth or not? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you know how we've often in uh, different discussions on our show, we've talked about this idea that you just don't know what you don't know. That's right. That's and right. until you make that conscious choice that I want to really understand mm -hmm. the real American history right, then right. you just continue operating in the dark and that's what we want to stop right. we want to shed that light on the true history of this country just to enlighten as right. many people as we possibly can so gail i mean mavis i think you had a comment as well well my comment at this point is <laughs> i happened to catch a quote uh from uh, kamala harris that mm. said we will all be better off if we remember and I just, I just think that's really powerful because we want to forget or hide or cover or discount somehow all of this past. Um, and I had mentioned earlier about how Robert P. Jones starts about talking about uh, the real beginning is not 1776. Sorry. It was genocide on our earth right. here in the United States. Of the, the the earth of the indigenous people, really, and then there was you know basically lynchings and slavery with black people, and uh, a point that I caught too was that 
South Africa went through some reconciliation in terms of apartheid, and even Rwanda went through, you know, truth and reconciliation. And uh, I think uh, Jones makes this point, we never have. No, that's right. The United States never has done any exercises about reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, to our detriment, because this is, this is something that we can face, we can learn from, and we can behave differently. I think about uh, Jeffrey Robinson saying, nobody in this room had slaves, but we're here to deal with it. So mm -hmm. let's figure out what happened and how we got here. Right. So uh, I just think that the, all of those things are going to stick in my head. It's better to remember what, how we got here. You know, sometimes I think I was just born into this lovely life. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't, it was stolen. It was basically mm -hmm. stolen. And um, it's, it's just, uh, it, it, like, like Gail was talking about compassion, knowing that even increases my compassion level more to think that I've gotten my place in life through no effort on my own. Right. Nothing. Yeah. And that there's been a continual um, effort nationally governed by government, every mm -hmm. and people to continue mm -hmm. to keep that from um, changing. Right. Yes. About history. Yes. Whether you're looking at the you know the Native Americans, or you're looking at that, the Black people, African Americans, whatever group you're looking at, there has been this incredible effort put into holding back. Holding everyone. back, and, and when and we hold being. back somebody else, we're holding back ourselves too. We yeah. can't have a healthy life or a healthy ability to live in our life when we can't ground ourselves in what that truth is, and we're hiding and we're attaching right. to lies. And I think somebody made a quote about that in, the, in one of the, the YouTube things we watched, mm -hmm. um, that healthy living can't exist when it's based on a lie. Uh, and you yeah. have that's to be willing to too. step into that truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah, I agree with what you both are saying. It's, it's impossible for me to imagine if we don't have a reckoning here, what this country is going to look like 25 years from now. Or yeah. when I think about Cairo and when Cairo is a 20 year old right. young man, what this country is going to look like if we do not, do not holistically take the time out to recognize where we come from. How did we even get to where we are right now? And what do we do as individuals, as organizations, as communities, what do we do to change the tide and to move this titanic situation into a different direction? Right. Yeah. Because we will not be able to survive and I think we're in a place now where at, at, while at the same time you have this one, you got these parallel tracks, right? So on one track, you have the efforts to hide history. I mean, like blatantly hide history, right? Yes. But then on the other track, you have people such as us or people such as Robert Jones or other individuals, Ibram Kendi, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who are making it their life work yeah. to tell the truth mm -hmm. and to make this, oh, make just give that awareness right. of where we really came from because if right. we don't recognize that, how do we move on? And I think there's a tidal wave my impression is that there's this tidal wave of movement. You know me, I always talk about this grass movement pushing things up. Yes. And I believe we are in that space where things are beginning to be pushed up because more and more is getting exposed. Right. And you can't just kill the truth away. I cannot. Um, I wanted to point out something about Mississippi mm -hmm. that's upsetting amongst a number of other things. But um, 
uh, Jones was talking about, you know, the memorial for Emmett Till and how the conversations like this are really where the change occurs that the monument was uh, formed mentally and emotionally. Uh, he says, you know, if, if the president had said, look, put a monument there, it would have happened very differently. But this swell came from the people. But anyway, it says, uh, years of effort in Mississippi have failed to dislodge what Jones terms the forces of white supremacy, which hardened in 2022 when the state passed a law to ban the teaching of critical race theory, despite no evidence that anything resembling critical race theory was being taught in primary and secondary public schools. So what do you have to do to get a law like that passed that is totally based on a lie? Mm -hmm. I mean, we it, it, people have to be educated in their own right and not look at a politician and say, I like him or her, or I don't. What are mm -hmm. they saying? What mm -hmm. are they trying to pass? I I, I didn't know it, uh, specifically about Mississippi on that law. In the year 2022 just smacks you. Like, right. how did how did this happen? Mm -hmm. How did this happen? Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's uh, it's a question that's worth uh, pondering. Mm -hmm. The way to really get at understanding how did this happen? People like Robert P. Jones are mm -hmm. in that pool of a not of knowledge and awareness and all mm -hmm. of that that we can all um, that we can pull from. Yes, definitely, definitely. I I really think this guy is awesome because mm -hmm. he's dug uh, into personal. Um, you know, and to documented history, Christian and otherwise, into all those tentacles and and pulled it all together for us. I mean, it's really this trilogy of books he has about white supremacy is just an amazing resource for us. So I'm very grateful to him. And I find it uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. And he's done his work. He has the research. He has yeah. the back. Mm -hmm. He has the information. Um, the and receipts put together. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah, that's what makes his work so powerful. Yeah. That this is not um, based on his opinion. It's not based yeah. on just merely his beliefs. This is based on historical records. And that's one of the things that I think throughout the course of this year that we've been really, really emphasizing is that you cannot ignore the host historical record. You can right, right. ban books. You can do that. But then now you have the banned book buses that are going in different communities throughout right. this country where you could get access to those books. And so what it boils down to is, again, this groundswell of, for this need for knowledge and this need to be educated, this need for truth is really, really rising up. And the higher it rises up, the more difficult it's going to be for the lies to continue. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. I agree. And in that uh, interview with Jones and, uh, you know, at Georgetown, um, they uh, mentioned about three people. I think it was a, a an indigenous person, a black person, and a white person started mm -hmm. bringing a certain issue to bear. It escapes me right now, but they weren't even activists. <laughs> Just y'all, this is what we found out. We're going to share this with you, and it had such a powerful oh. effect. And I love that. You know, we don't it, Americans tend to be a little bureaucratic about everything. It's like, no, figure out the truth and then speak it, right? right? Yeah, it doesn't take a big march down the street. Just talk to your family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about what you've learned. Right. Mm -hmm. And Good I think, the, yeah, yeah, that's the value of taking this conversational um, approach mm -hmm. and between the critical self-reflection and acknowledging I don't know what I don't know and finally engaging in genuine conversations where part of your intention is to listen 
for the purpose of understanding, particularly when it's a view that is completely different from your own. That it's really important for you to be able to engage in those conversations, step into that vulnerability, as I mentioned earlier, it's stepping into that vulnerability. But if we don't take those courageous steps, if we don't step into our own individual vulnerability and understand what role am I playing as an individual? Because as an individual, I am a part of a family. I'm a part of a work environment, an organization, and I'm also a part of a community. And everywhere I go, I'm bringing myself with me. Right. And so when you begin to really understand within the context of history, where you are, I talk about it all the time, your thoughts, your beliefs, and your ideas and what is flowing out from you into the world through your words, your actions, and your behaviors because you're having an impact or an influence somewhere and on someone, right? And so it's really about checking yourself as an individual and understanding how do I want to engage in this, this history, this new history that I am being exposed to? Right. So if I put that question to you, the two of you, what would be your response? How do I personally want to engage with this history? And then after this, we'll take a two minute break and then uh, come back to continue. So what from your perspective, your own personal perspectives, how do you two engage with history within that context that we're talking about? I want to know it. I want to learn it. Um, yeah. And I want to live from that. I believe we cannot change any of our behavior, thoughts, or feelings without changing our belief system. And so to change the belief system, you have to find accuracy and truth. And so I'm going to, I would seek that out. I would seek more and more of that out. Excellent. Excellent. Mavis? Yeah, I, I would echo that 100%. Um, yeah, I just want to know it and uh, try and forget my... Uh, grievances of the past the things that I said when I didn't know you mm -hmm. know and and go forward um uh, Jones actually was referring to uh Biden's speech about uh you know facing our our ethnic strife and he says um that Jones or Jones sees within contemporary America a pernicious refusal to accept remembrance mm -hmm. of the form that Biden has promoted the nation will can never fully achieve its ethical and political aspirations while living with falsehoods about the past. I don't want to live with falsehoods no. about my past or anybody else's. Amen. That was, that. That was not Amen. democracy, right? Right, right. Democracy. right. I and love then to live says, democracy. Exactly. It says, so, and that provides essential moral guidance. Absolutely. Lord, no, we need That's moral right. guidance. Right. Yeah, so we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break and come back and continue this fascinating uh, conversation. So welcome back to Inflection Point Podcast. And our discussion for today is Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future, a book written by Dr. Robert P. Jones, president and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute. So let's uh, kind of get our conversation uh, back on track. And I wanna shift it just a little bit. And I'd like to shift it to talking about the mapping of the doctrine of discovery, because I really believe that this is one of those fundamental documents that really helps to explain how this country's, uh, the real roots of this country, if you will. And so I wanna read a quote from, um, this actually comes from the Library of Congress, and it says, one of Robert P. Jones's boldest suggestions is to locate the roots of American racism within religious practices developed in the aftermath 
of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the new world. So there's a lot that's packed in that statement. We're talking about religious practices. We're talking about the whole Christopher Columbus uh, myth, if you will, his arrival in the new world and et cetera, and how that genealogy of modern racism and its connection to the doctrine of discovery, right? And so when you think about that, the doctor, I'm just going to read a few, um, a couple of um, descriptive items that are related to the doctrine of discovery, discovery. And it was really about reframing American origins and explaining how the United States built this philosophical framework for a democracy, a democratic society on a foundation of mass racial violence, right? And so one of the tenets, if you will, of the doctrine of discovery is this idea that God designated America as a new promised land. Now, now just kind of let that sink in. So if you're a Bible studier, if you know the word of God, if you understand things that happen from a biblical perspective, like how do you digest that, right? How do you digest this idea of God designating America as a new promised land. So we know in scripture where it's talking about the promised land, it's related directly to God's chosen people and the land that was promised to them. So how do you leap from that into America being the new promised land? Just kind of think about that and let that, let that sink in. And then thinking about how all of that shaped how centuries of Europeans would come to understand the new world and the people who populated it. So Mavis Gale, how does that resonate with you? <laughs> I'll go first, Gail. <laughs> I just think of the hubris somebody had, the Pope, whoever it was, to even think of that. How can you think that you were designated basically superior mm -hmm. and that that land gets to be yours for free? It is. It is so, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Gail, when you, you you have the sense of yourself that everything is yours, it's more than entitlement. It's not. It's narcissistic, but it's, it's narcissistic, narcissistic. You know, and, yeah. and yeah, and entitled. That it will, of course, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. But you know, Columbus had to have a sense of what he wanted to do was mm -hmm. not okay, right? Because he went and sought out the, the Pope's um, validation of that in mm -hmm. order in writing this, right? The Doctrine of Discovery. And it was stated in there. So it, it gave him justification to come back to the Americas and then start telling people just do, doing everything that had happened. It wasn't that he um, he had to, they, uh, the people had to fight against the Native Americans. They were killing them. And so, of course, they were going to start fighting against them. Right. There are there people were being attacked there. You know, their villages, their everything. I mean, we're they're being pushed away. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they're going to fight back. Stolen, robbed, raped. Right. Everything. Everything. It's like somebody said on one of the YouTubes that um, the word pioneer really means violent colonizer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's exactly what happened. But Columbus had to know that what he was going to do and how he had to do it was going to become very violent. Mm -hmm. And then again, it connects back to this doctrine of the discovery, right. sort of this international right. law of colonialism, yes. right? And it gave the right to go in and kill, conquer, and reduce their personhood to the perpetual slavery. That's right, because it states that in that in that doctrine. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. It and so, yeah. 
Right. And so one of the other points that's connected to this is really understanding the interconnection between land and slavery, because uh, colonization, colonialism was all about acquiring land. Mm -hmm. Right. But now that you've acquired this land, you need to be able to have people work that land, so to speak, so that that land can be productive. And that's where enslavement comes in. So the enslavement of Africans was the continuation, according to Jones, or, or I'm sorry, yes, according to uh, Jones, in connection to the doctrine of um, doctrine of discovery, was the continuation of genocide and disposition, dispossession flowing from the first European contact with Native Americans, right. the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And so when you really begin to examine history at that depth, mm -hmm. you begin to see how these things were so interconnected. You know what vision keeps coming to my head right now? Western movies. Uh, mm -hmm. How? How? Yes. And I watched them as a child. I didn't oh, yes, watch them. I did, yeah. But, mm -hmm. you know, I thought it was just too violent, but it's like, how in the world? And so, they, but that's they the, yeah, the bad guy image through my life. Right, exactly. But that shows how we had been socialized mm -hmm. yeah. into mm -hmm. believing the whole Christopher Columbus myth. Right. Absolutely. And socialized into not from that histor that historical perspective into not connecting these things together. The land and enslavement mm -hmm. connects directly mm -hmm. to indigenous people and slave ownership. Like those two things are inextricably linked to mm -hmm. one another. And it all flows back to this doctrine of discovery that said, essentially, that's okay for you to go in and do that. Because if the, if the people were not Christians or under a Christian realm, then yeah. they were not considered to be equal to. Mm -hmm. And that gave them permission from the Pope to go ahead and destroy and kill and create genocide i mean and even in the slave trade they they targeted uh slaves in the country that knew how to do farming because they needed that free labor right and so, i mean right, even absolutely. They needed the land and then they needed the free labor and both were then justified under this doctrine of supremacy of white supremacy didn't they see the suffering right in front oh. of them you know right. the the cries of kids the blood oh the fear in people's eyes didn't they ever question i wonder if they ever questioned themselves like yeah this doesn't feel great <laughs> well unfortunately we are living in a time when that's happening right in front of us of course right right yeah. and so there are um and some of the other information that i gathered about the doctrine of discovery specifically from um a website called doctrineofdiscovery.org and they listed these 10 legal dimensions of the doctrine of discovery and i'm just going to mention a few of them here the the one of them is this idea of first discovery right and so this uh uh idea stated that the first european country to, to discover lands and, and so discover lands that were unknown to other Europeans, even though they were known to people who were non-European, right? right? Uh, to claim that property and to claim sovereign rights over the lands and the native people. So this idea of controlling land and controlling people is embedded in this idea of first discovery, right? That's so counterintuitive to democracy. Democratic. Right, exactly. It is totally opposite. Totally counterintuitive. Exactly. And so it goes on to mention 
this idea of actual occupancy and current possession to turn first discovery into a recognized title, if you will, a European <laughs> a country, I think Gail, you alluded to this um, earlier, a European country had to actually occupy and possess these quote unquote newfound lands. And this was usually done by building forts and settlements, uh, taking physical possessions to be accomplished within a reasonable amount of time after the first discovery to create now complete title, meaning that you now are entitled completely to this land, irrespective of anyone who was already occupying that land. Then it goes on further to connect it to Christianity, right? Religion was a significant aspect of the doctrine of discovery. And under discovery, non-Christian peoples were not deemed to have the same rights to land, sovereignty, or self-determination. So I want to read that again. Non-Christian peoples were not deemed to have the same rights to land, sovereignty, and self-determination as Christians. And so part of the way that you kind of um, justify that, if you will, is to begin to use labels like barbarism, savagery, and things like that. These types of labels that you're now applying to these individuals that you have encountered on their own land, which you have now taken possession of, and the justification of that is that they are um, beneath you, that they are savages. And I want to share a story. Um, it was uh, a story connected to my daughter, uh, Olivia, when she was about five. And she was at school. And you know how when they, in elementary school, when they do the whole Thanksgiving thing and they show these pictures of um the uh, colonizers and, you know, having this fabulous dinner, this Thanksgiving dinner with the um, indigenous people. And when my daughter was describing the activity that they had done in school, she used the word savages. And so I had to sit her down and explain to her what a savage was. Like, what is the definition of a savage? Now, mind you, she's like a five-year-old kid, right? But it just so happened that at the time I had in my home library, a book on, uh, a, it was a Native American encyclopedia. So I sat her down and we just flip, literally flipped through the pages. And I asked her, what do you see? Do you see savagery? What do you see? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in her little mind, she recognized the fact that this was a mislabel. She didn't fully understand it, but all I had to do was show her pictures. You know how we talk a lot about how that imagery is so important. I just showed her pictures and she got what I was talking about. And I told her, I gave her the responsibility when you go to school tomorrow, you have to tell your teacher that your mother told you that you are not allowed to refer to anybody as a savage, right? And I had her take that book to school with her. And the teacher and I consequently, or, or subsequently, I should say, had a conversation about it. And the teacher ended up being apologetic about the whole incident. And I had to reemphasize that that is not the kind of information that I teach to my daughter. Mm. Good. If only every parent would do that instead of the reverse, which is, I don't want them to know about any killings. Exactly. And, and who are the truth. savages, right? Yeah. Who really? Yeah. Who were the savages? Right. In, right. in exactly. that way, right? It was not the people that lived here first. Yeah. Exactly. And this country. Yeah. Again, just this alignment of Christianity against 
this idea of colonization and all of that, it's literally like you're using the word of God. Yeah. Say you're entitled. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. To say that you are superior, to say that you are above and have the right to sovereignty over other individuals. Right. Right. right? That goes against everything that I've ever been taught about the love of Christ and what it really means to be a follower of Christ, right? right. right? Yeah. And then finally, one other point that is brought out is this uh, is around this concept of civilization. The Europeans' ideas of superiority based on the belief that God had directed them to bring so-called civilized ways education and religion to indigenous indigenous peoples and to exercise paternalism and guardianship powers over them. Just really, really let that sink in. You are taking yourself and elevating yourself up to this level. And then you're calling God a liar, essentially, by saying this is what he has given us to permission to do. Right. Yeah. Superimposing. Super entitlement on the and Bible. So I just, yeah, I find this just so wounding from a, a believer perspective. Oh. I I it it you know it hits at your ability to trust what you hear from the pulpit. Because it's still happening. Right. Yes. Still yeah. happening. Right. And, yeah. you know, this is the way it's done. And, you know, a lot of these mega churches are, you know, led by white men. And it's not going too well for women there either. Right. <laughs> exactly. There's still There's hierarchy. Yeah. Christian faith is still being co opted to hurt people and to suppress That's right. people. That's right. And I'm not a part of that. I know that, but mm -hmm. you still see it happen. I can feel it happening. I mentioned about at one of my prior churches, you mm -hmm. know, the, even the question, can women be leaders? Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, one thing that surprised me in this whole study was the term Southern Baptist. Now mm -hmm. I've heard that term my whole life. And I did not know that there was a break in the Baptist church itself based on the confederacies moving right. away from the north mm -hmm. so they wanted their own southern view and their ability to keep slavery and you know kind of build this safe this uh, ease of conscience mm -hmm. i say you know I'm a, I'm a southern baptist and this is okay with us i had no idea no mm -hmm. idea that's what southern baptist meant and that, you know, that organization is struggling to this day mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But I think it just goes to show you how strongly entrenched the idea of Christianity actually is in these things that we're talking about from colonialism to enslavement, how entrenched Christianity is and all of that. And I'm not talking about biblical Christianity. Exactly. I am talking about philosophical, if you will, Christianity, Christianity that is used to justify mm -hmm. certain things in our something. history. Yes. Mm -hmm. Justifying slavery. Right. Just oh. got find the stealing of land because we have the right to take this land because you're a heathen and you're not a Christian. We have the right to take your land and you do that in the name of God. That's not the God that well, I right because what not doing, the God they're, they're, that I know. They're mm -hmm. given permission to judge who is exactly. that who is and the one message that Christ taught was don't judge judge not exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's just, um, I just feel like we are still so strongly in this place of exposure, if you will, mm -hmm. and just really, really getting the truth out there, even when it has to be um, 
um, embedded in formal churches and formal religious organizations and understanding that connection to the enslavement and dispossession of indigenous people right. in this country, that those things are linked together. Even the KKK started out as right. a Christian yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. If that doesn't blow exactly. off the top of your head, that is <laughs> crazy. That's exactly. all very validated in what they're doing, right? Mm hmm. And uh, so one of the things that um, I've been just sort of watching because uh, this uh, shift from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, mm -hmm. and that's all based on this recogni recognizing um, the significance and the need right. for a broader understanding right. of American history that includes the contributions, the lived experiences, the perspectives of indigenous people as well as African-American peoples. Because when you look at it, those concepts are all melded together in a common history. Right. We need to know it and remember it. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So we have about two more minutes left. So I want to kind of close um, our discussion today with a quote. And this quote is a Robert P. Jones quote from the book, White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. It's nothing short of astonishing that a religious tradition with this, this relentless emphasis on salvation and one so hyper attuned to personal sin can simultaneously maintain such blindness to social sins swirling about it, such as slavery and race-based segregation and bigotry. So again, as always, at the end of our um, discussions, I related back to the Cairo question. Right. Will three year old Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which he was born? And as always, the final question to our listeners is this. What will you do to ensure that Cairo and his contemporaries have the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which they were born? because we all have that responsibility to future generations. And what we do today in making our own personal decisions is going to impact what the future looks like for three-year-olds just like Cairo. Right. So I wanna thank you for joining us and we'll see you the next time at Inflection Point Podcast right here on Transformation Talk Radio. We are here every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. The journey towards anti-racism and social change doesn't stop here. Truth, reconciliation, and healing come from ongoing, open, honest, and deliberate conversations. Continue to dive in and deconstruct your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs as we band together to manifest social change. Tune in to Inflection Point Podcast every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern here on TransformationTalkRadio.com for more conversations about how we can cultivate change from the inside out.